Wachek Misawe, hello everyone. Mikwan Tulpin and Dishna Kaso um, here, and you are turning, tuning into a conversation between myself, Kier Johnston, my good friend, and our guest Dallas Squire from Ongahome Games. And this is a feature um, interview here at the Ryerson 2020 Powwow Education Week. So I'll kick it over to Kier to tell him more about himself before uh, Dallas explains a little bit more about Ongahome Games. Thanks, Meeks. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Keir Johnson. I'm a member of Chippewa Thames First Nation, so that's just outside of uh, London, Ontario. Um, I've worked with uh, Mequon and Dallas uh, over the last couple of years in different capacities, but uh, excited to be invited to the, the Ryerson Education Week to uh, talk about uh, lacrosse and about sport and a little bit what it means to me and, and also um, learn more from Dallas uh, and Mequon in the, uh, the game of lacrosse. So. Dallas. Yeah, hi guys, thanks. Uh, and again, thanks to Ryerson for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, my name is Dallas Squire, I'm a Mohawk from Six Nations, uh, part of what's called the Turtle Clan family. And um, happy to be here. Uh, I do have a business called Ongwehoe Games, and Ongwehoe uh, is a Mohawk word that translates into real people or first people. And um, uh, so I, I created a business all about that, uh, Ongwehoe Games. And my business uh, is about going out to places and sharing culture, history, and games. And uh, everything's all connected. And um, and uh, we'll talk a bit more about that as we go. But yeah, that's who I am and, and that's what I do. Beautiful. And um, <clears throat> I'm a Meshkegwak Cree as well as a proud Belgian. Um, residing in Ontario, I always like to say that I'm a proud Ontarian here in Canada. <laughs> um, but from Fort Albany First Nation and I'm currently involved uh, within the province's provincial indigenous sport body and a lot of um, other involvement through lacrosse as a athlete, a coach, um, and that role is growing every day with more inclusive opportunities and uh, invitations to circles like this. It's not typical for my nation uh, to be participating, you know, in leagues and, and international, <clears throat> excuse me, stages of lacrosse. Um, it's fairly popular to the Anishinaabe and a lot of the Haudenosaunee nations at this time. But what I'm really excited is to have Dallas Squire here because he is also a former uh, professional lacrosse player and he's been sharing in a culture and games for over a decade, about 10 years now, right Dallas? Yeah, yeah, at, at least that, that um, not in more, not in a coaching um, sense, but more of a sharing, going into schools, doing different groups um, and things like that. So I love it. And for those watching this conversation, uh, lacrosse has so many different names. Like, I mean, we call it lax, we call it bagadawe, uh, there's, you know, so many different names, but um, toward the wardon even, right? So maybe let's talk about the history of lacrosse and maybe where some of those names come from and the nations and the languages that are involved, right? So I guess for you, Dallas, where does lacrosse come from and what you've come to know? Okay, well, uh, yeah, it's lacrosse is, is a beautiful sport to, you know, particularly Haudenosaunee people. Um, for those that do not know, Haudenosaunee is a Six Nations word uh, that translates into people of the long house. So it describes our traditional dwellings, which kind of look like a big loaf of bread, if you will. Uh, that was our, our long house. So Haudenosaunee, again, people of the long house. So lacrosse, um, very, very special, very sacred to um, Six Nations people, Haudenosaunee people. Um, it has connections right back to our story of creation. So ever since the world began, um, lacrosse for Six Nations people has been there. And um, so the, the origins of lacrosse for Six Nations people um, has a rooted connection. Um, so rooted, it's, it's crazy. Uh, Six Nations is the hot bit, in my view, of lacrosse. Um, largely because of that that cultural connection. Now we have other communities as well that are part of the Six Nations like Onondaga, um, Tuscarora, uh, the Oneidas uh, all hold that um, connection to lacrosse very dear. Six Nations has been very privileged I think in a way that uh, lacrosse developed uh, more mainstream within the area. So today you'll see Six Nations um, at the forefront of team play. Um, teams like the Six Nations Chiefs, the Six Nations Arrows and the Rebels, all um, Canadian champions um, in the past. And uh, so lacrosse is just blowing up, um, but definitely stems from that deep-rooted cultural connection 
right back to the time of creation and our creation story. So for me, that, that, that is the root of lacrosse. Now there are history of lacrosse, um, stems from that, and uh, there's a long history in that as well. And uh, I think um, maybe we can get in, into that a little bit later, but uh, that's the origins for me. Mm -hmm. Lacrosse, the fastest game on two feet, it's known as, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, absolutely. You cannot glide in lacrosse. There are no skates to glide on in lacrosse. <laughs> Everything is motion. Um, you should never really be standing still uh, for very long playing lacrosse. That's awesome. Right. Uh, just with uh, something, or you know, kind of, I see a, a, tr a traditional stick kind of behind you there, or a mm -hmm. actually. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So um, we'll talk about uh, this this little beauty of a stick here. Now, um, of the six nations, uh, different nations have their own version of it. Um, this stick is actually not from the Six Nations. Um, this is the Anishinaabe version of the lacrosse stick. And um, I know the Oneida folk as well play this version of, of the game. Um, there's, uh, throughout my travels, learning about traditional games, it's a, it's a beautiful thing, the similarities between cultures. Um, different nations have different versions of stick ball games. So this is not six, six Nations, this is Anishinaabe version of the stick ball game. I do not know what it's called though. Any help here from you, Meeks? Bagadawe or Bagadawewin? One word I've heard. Yeah. Um, and a, another translation, I, I do not know what the word is, but a, a friend of mine um, translated for me uh, the original word and it, it translated similar to the Cuban nation. Um, and I heard you say that earlier, Meeks. Can you say that again? The Cayuga Nation? I'm not sure if it was Cayuga or Onondaga or <laughs> I know one of the ones, but I believe it was Ehongo uh, Jikwe, something similar to that. Yes. Yeah. yes. And that means, uh, translates into bumping hips. Yeah. So the Anishinaabe word for this translates into something similar, bumping hips. So it's a very physical game. And if you were to play this and, and try to pick up the ball from the ground, you would essentially be bumping hips, trying to block out the opposition or whoever's trying to pick that that game up. So a very, very uh, ancient game as well. Um, Anishinaabe style stick, um, bumping hips and uh, a beautiful game. So this next stick I have, this stick here is um, more what the Haudenosaunee people were known for. Um, it's a, a very big piece of wood, a very, very heavy stick. And we're known for the long pocketed sticks. So I have some old sticks in my possession that the pockets come all the way down to here even. And mm -hmm. it can be a lot more narrow. But um, this is the style of stick that Six Nations people were known for. And um, it's a Mohawk word for lacrosse is Dewa Alado. Dewa Alado. Now I believe there's an award in um, American field lacrosse called the Tawarton Award. And Tawarton is just um, Dewa Aladin mispronounced. So Dewa Holiday <laughs> is our, the Mohawk word for it. And uh, yeah, so th this is the, a traditional style stick made out of wood, um, hickory wood normally, and um, rawhide for the sidewall here. And uh, the brown runners in here are a leather from an animal traditionally. Now this one's been modernized with a nylon. We didn't have that a long time ago, but uh, the, the style of the stick is an old school throwback stick. Something we would have used probably a hundred years ago or more. And I think it's it's pretty it's a pretty incredible piece and instrument to have in your hand because it's it's more than just a stick, right? It was a living entity before. It was it was a tall, standing, strong tree. And we have some uh, mutual friends who happen to be like uh, wooden stick makers, right, of yeah. the traditional style and stuff. And to see the process of the you know the trees going from straight and bending, if you want to talk a bit more about that, just uh, for anyone who you know has interest in those old styles. Right, um, so a long, long time ago, back when I used to play, when I was a young man, uh, I used a wooden stick. Now the game has kind of morphed into a modern style where there's plastic head sticks with aluminum shafts. And but a long time ago, you know, it, it wasn't always like that. Um, lacrosse, again, being connected to the culture, um, this is in another way. I was told by elders that when you hold a traditional stick in your hand, you're essentially embodying three spirits. The wood, which came from a living tree, um, embodies a spirit. The nylon, or not the nylon, the leather in the in the the pocket of the stick 
comes from an animal which also had a spirit and yourself you have a spirit as well so when you hold stick you're embodying three spirits and we call that good medicine right and uh so every time a stick is made um you're giving thanks for that that process as well now i come from a, a family um of lacrosse right uh, my my father played in the professional leagues uh, my grandfather did as well uh, i have a ton of cousins that play professionally in my family my grandfather actually used to make lacrosse sticks so i was very lucky to have um lacrosse sticks available for me all the time i didn't have to pay for them right because my family made them um nowadays you're looking at a stick a uh, traditional wooden stick this can be up to 300 dollars um, because of the process now the process to make a wooden stick like this takes about a year it takes about a year so uh we tend to go and harvest uh, a hickory tree uh, in, in the winter months, January, February, is when we'll go out and harvest a hickory tree. And when we harvest that hickory tree, again, we give thanks for that tree because it's part of, of, of this life, right? Everything's interconnected. We believe everything has a spirit. And so we're honoring that tree for giving us the opportunity to make this lacrosse stick so that we can play the game um, that we have have played since time of creation. So again, harvesting that, that hickory tree and uh, it takes so long because there's a drying process, right? I could not just cut a tree down, shape it into this, and I'm good to go. It would straighten back out immediately almost. Um, so we have to dry the wood out. And the wood takes uh, several months to dry. And so after the wood is dry, you start to, to um, cut down this log and just ha start having it up, halves, halves, and, um, and to a workable size. And um, when I'm out working with, with children, I ask them, how do you think you bend a piece of wood? Um, and uh, because it's a wood is very pliable when steam is applied to it. So you use steam to heat up a straight piece of wood and after about an hour or so, it becomes pliable enough to bend. And there's different ways you can bend it. I think traditionally, uh, people could have used a tree to bend this around. That's why you would have different shapes and sizes of the stick um, based on what was available around you. Um, nowadays, I believe people make a sort of jig to go in the center and they bend the tree around it and you just clamp it up together because the wood is pliable, it will bend, it will take this form, but you have to make sure you clamp it all together in shape and again, let that dry. So again, there's a drying process of that and um, and it will dry and, and hold this shape. It will hold this shape and at that point you have your shape of lacrosse stick and um, traditionally, again, hide from an animal, most likely a deer, was used to make the pocket of the stick. Um, the underbelly of the animal, the rawhide, uh, was used as well to, um, because if, if you had a whole piece of wood around here, that'd be one heavy stick. I don't think you'd be able to wield it and throw with that stick very well. So rawhide is used on the side to create the side walls to connect to the bottom here, to hold this net tight or taut. Um, and so that's, in a nutshell, the process. Uh, again, we're giving thanks for everything we, we take. The, the animal that was used for the, the raw or for the the leather inside, uh, hunters would give thanks for that as well. Uh, my friends that go hunting today, they still give thanks for that animal that they're about to take because it again is a living thing, and um, we're always taught to respect all living things, no matter what they are. And um, making a traditional acrostic is no different. It's quite a process very time consuming. Uh, that's why you're gonna see prices in two to 300 range for traditional lacrosse sticks nowadays. Again, you cannot use these in the professional leagues any longer. Um, one of the main reasons is this is like a weapon, right? Uh, if you chop someone in an arm, um, I've seen people break their arms from getting hit with a wooden lacrosse stick before. So safety is a big factor. Uh, we still use these traditionally. You know, traditionally for our people, um, there's a, a game held yearly around April um, to honor the Thunder Beings. And uh, everybody will get out their traditional sticks and we'll, we'll have a game, a more basic game than it's played in uh, without referees and things like that. But um, these sticks are still very important to the people, uh, the Haudenosaunee people, and um, still people that make them in our community. And uh, not a whole lot of people, only a handful, but um, still very, very uh, a precious process. Anything else on that, Meeks? Oh yeah, I, <clears throat> I loved everything you were sharing there because I mean, obviously beyond you know fun and celebration and social socializing, there's different elements to those aspects that are healing. You know, it's 
it's Absolutely. not always just ceremonial, right? But that has been used uh, for this as well. So when they call it the medicine game, right? Uh, on yeah. that spiritual context. Um, and I think in more recent times, it's been put on sort of like a political platform or, or a stance, not just throughout the world, but even here on Turtle Island in North America, right? That's so, nice. but one, um, one thing that you had mentioned there about the generations and stuff in your family, you know, those who participated in lacrosse throughout the years, um, tell me more about that. Like, what was your probably your first or earliest memory uh, playing lacrosse, or how were you first introduced? You mentioned like when you were really young, but your earliest memory right, right. probably with your stick. Right. I, I think if um, if anybody has uh, had the opportunity to come to a First Nations community, particularly Six Nations, as you drive throughout the territory, you're going to see lacrosse nets. Um, you're going to see kids out. <laughs> playing with their sticks um, almost any time of, of the year as well. I've seen kids playing in the snow with their stick. Um, so that for me is my earliest memories is playing with my family. Um, you know, my brothers grew up playing the game, my father, my grandfather. So always being uh, connected to the game through them, through family. And I think that's what makes uh, um, a community like Six Nations so unique. Um, we tend to know each other. Um, our community. If we don't know everybody in our community, we know somebody that knows somebody from the community. So it's not like, um, you know, I know a lot of families that live in small towns that do not know their neighbors. They could be a stone throw away from them, but have no idea who they are. We tend to grow up with one another in small communities and um, therefore we're playing ever since we're babies with this. So I, I spent a lot of time outside playing with, like I said, my family, my brothers, my cousins, playing lacrosse. Uh, I remember being in the arenas, um, watching my father play. I don't have a vivid memories of my father playing, but there are a couple. But always being in the arenas, um, following my brothers around to their games. And uh, so, um, just something that was there, you know. Um, one of the things uh, in, our, in our culture that some people do, not everybody, is when babies are born, they're gifted a lacrosse stick. This is a small one, but we're gifted a lacrosse stick. Again, since the time of coming into this world, we're, we're, we're introduced to this game. So earliest memories for me would definitely be uh, friends and family playing outside and, um, and just picking up skills um, naturally, right? There's no instruction, you just grab a stick and you go. And um, that is some of the earliest uh, memories. Now, as I grew up playing again, my father, uh, he's the Hall of Fame member and um, just, um, being around him, hearing the stories. Again, I was a bit young to really watch him play and remember a lot of those things, but hearing the stories from families and friends, again, that had been involved in the game. And um, so it was a natural uh, progression for me to get into lacrosse. My father never made me play the game um, just because he played professionally. He never put that, that pressure on me to play the game. And, but I just gravitated towards it. It was something that um, for me embodies so many things. You have the cultural side of it, the, the connection spiritually to the game being part of our creation story. And when you're, you're holding this, this wooden stick, the, um, the honor you feel by being a part of the spiritual connection. And um, yeah, and just compete, competing, I, I think was a big thing for me being young as I grew up, wanting to um, have competition involved in my life. And I believe for me as a young man, really helped me um, uh, have an outlet, have an outlet because, uh, and we call that good medicine. Um, anytime you're doing something that you have an outlet to release energy uh, is a good thing, right? And knowing both of you guys, I know you have your, your sports and, and things that you like to do. And that's what I'm talking about right there, that outlet, something you're very passionate about. Because when I played lacrosse, no matter what was going on in my life that wasn't fun or you know enjoyable, it didn't matter on the floor because I was focused on playing this game and that was was good medicine. Now, in our Haudenosaunee culture, um, there's a couple different ways you can look at lacrosse being medicine. One of them, um, again, being that feeling of being lost in something that you're doing and focused and just um, having a, a release for um, your energy. Uh, that's one way of good medicine. Uh, spiritually, we also use this game as a healing game as well. Um, traditionally, we would gather all of our family and friends, each with our traditional lacrosse sticks, and have a game of lacrosse in honor of people that were, were sick or needed some good medicine. And um, 
So we would play focusing all of our energy towards that person in need. Now, uh, spiritual doesn't quite fit into the Western world of medicine, but um, the way I view it even today is that if you can put a smile on someone's face and let them forget about their problems for one second, that is good medicine. So even today, this, this game is still good medicine. And I have yet to meet a, um, a student that doesn't smile when they hold a lacrosse in their hand. Uh, that's instant, it's almost instant. If I hand this to someone, they, they light up. And, and that's the beauty of the game. And that's why I love it so much. And not even just for the players and those holding the stick, even for the spectators, right? Absolutely. Um, in First Nations community, family is everything, right? So you're, you're, we're dragging your kids to the arena or to the outdoors to watch kids play games. And they are passionate about it because that's their, their aunties, their uncles, their families out there playing and they're competing. And so excitement and entertainment for anybody watching is high value in First Nations communities when it comes to lacrosse. And just like, uh, you know, football players pack the stadiums. You know, there's that excitement. Um, so once you, uh, I, I think it's um, a, a very special connection if you know somebody on the floor playing as well, right? Uh, instead of going to a, a hockey game and not having a personal connection with anybody in lacrosse and small communities, you tend to know and have that personal connection with someone. And it just heightens the excitement when you're watching because you want them to do well. You want them to be uh, happy at what they're doing for sure. That's awesome. Um, now, it's just when you're you're kind of talking about, you know, the harvesting of sticks and things like that, it really kind of connected uh, me back to, I'm a big canoeist, so just around um, the harvesting of, of uh, materials to, to make both, to make paddles and, and uh, you know, the ceremonies around that. So. Um, it was really cool how kind of First Nation traditional sports is, you know, how they're they're all connected that way with um, just all spirits. And, and so I really thank you for that. And it's uh, kind of connected there. But um, also, I, I know uh, you talked about the sticks, but what about uh, the ball? The actual, uh, you guys, I heard you say it was a ball and stick game. I was just kind of yeah. about the ball. Oh. I don't have a ball. I have a ball, but I don't have it in here. I f totally forgot about that here. But um, thanks for that. So <laughs> I've got a ball. I'll find one. Yeah. So tr traditionally, like we never had synthetic materials, right? We couldn't create a rubber ball. Um, so all of the games we play, and for Ongoi Hoi games, what I do is it's not just lacrosse because I believe we can use sport to start building these cultural bridges, right? And um, so that's what I do through the games is build that connection. Now, Miquan, what are you holding? A lacrosse ball? Hard yeah. rubber. Hard rubber ball, right? And I've heard that referred to as the Indian rubber ball. Um, but we never, traditionally never created that. Our balls were made out of leather, right? And, and what I have here, this is a double ball, but our balls would have been something like that, made out of hide from an animal. And I have people ask me, well, what would have been inside that? And again, we never had synthetic materials. So you'd put inside a traditional lacrosse ball whatever you wanted it could be any size any weight if you wanted to put stones in a traditional ball that was up to you I wouldn't play with you but um, if you wanted a stone ball that would be totally up to you um, some typical things that would go inside a, a, a traditional ball would have been grasses or seeds for some weight um, and really whatever was within your reach or you wanted to go out and get to put inside that that's what you did to make that and again, um, I feel like there's a special connection when you're actually making these games yourself. You're making your own ball, right? And, and to have that connection is a beautiful thing. Yeah, I, I've also heard, um, like, uh, when, you, when you're talking about medicine game and, and when you're making the ball, and you also said you, sometimes you, you guys gather and you play for someone, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you put kind of prayers within that ball and, and that ball good of, with good thoughts and good medicine. Right. Um, uh, I think that's, uh, I mean, uh, is, can you touch on that at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, for uh, Mohawk people, and, and, and you know, things can differ from family to family, definitely nation to nation. Um, but I, I know my family, um, burning tobacco is um, a connection to the, the creator. So um, we do a lot of that. Uh, in ceremony and um, one of the ways that uh, we do that is we'll, we'll take um, traditional tobacco not not cigarette tobacco uh, traditional tobacco and we'll dry the leaves out and then we'll, we'll grind up the leaves 
And um, when we're doing ceremony, we'll pass this, this tobacco around to each person. And each person will, will touch this tobacco and, and put their thoughts and their prayers into this tobacco. And at the end of it, once everybody's done that, we'll burn that tobacco. And that tobacco, uh, once it's burned, creates smoke, right? Everything smokes. And it's uh, our belief that that is our direct connection to the Creator through burning that tobacco. So thoughts and prayers, uh, well wishes, whatever it may be that you put into that tobacco are carried to the Creator through this smoke. And so, um, but there are different things that, that people can do. They can essentially um, put tobacco in the ball as well um, as part of that to make that connection. It can vary, right? I, I believe it, it's whatever um, people want to do, whatever works for you, whatever makes you feel like you've had that special connection to that. But um, definitely for my family, that's one of the way, uh, one of the uses for traditional tobacco is using it through ceremony, connecting us, connecting us directly to the Creator. Thank you for sharing all of this so far. Um, and just back to talking about, you know, the creation of the stick and stuff like that and Ongo Hanwe games. Can people kind of make their own sticks nowadays? I know uh, through traveling with Kier or yourselves with um, Ongo Hanwe games and Iroquois lacrosse program, we encourage people to be creative, right? So for myself, uh, there wasn't a lacrosse store around. I didn't even know about lacrosse beyond, you know, what my mom was able to teach me when she worked at the Woodland Cultural Museum in Brantford. And then eventually my first introduction uh, to lacrosse was with those scoop cones. So it was like those plastic, large, tall scoops. And it had a big, large wiffle ball with like the holes in it. And we'd pass that around and that would be our lacrosse game. But uh, until I got a little older and in my, my later high school years, I didn't actually get to pick up a lacrosse stick myself even. Um, so being from a remote community, you know, but having to live uh, in southern, being in Southern Ontario where I was, where I was born and mostly grew up, uh, my introduction to lacrosse is way, way different than yourself, right? So um, yeah. I'm glad that we were able to talk about, you know, the evolution and the history of the game, but how do you play it? How about that? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, the beauty about uh, the, the traditional games that I share and, uh, and there are others that, that um, I don't know uh, a whole lot about as well, but I, I think the, the beauty of it all is, is they can all be created and, and um, not duplicated, but redone in a different way even as well. And um, as far as making a lacrosse stick goes, uh, it might be a bit difficult for some people, but I think anybody that wanted to put their mind to it could definitely do it. And uh, some of the other games that, that I share with Nguyenwe Games are um, maybe less involved as far as creating what you need to play the game. And I, I think um, they are beautiful because as kids, I'm sure we all played in our backyard at a friend's house and created games, we just made up games on our own and, um, and creating rules on our own as we go, as you play the game as well. Um, the beauty about all these games, there's traditionally, there was really no hard set fast rule. Um, rules of the game, much uh, unlike today where you have referees and, and you can't hit a certain way and things like that. Um, traditionally, there, there wasn't really that. You made the rules up as you went. So some of the other games I have that are kind of spin-offs of lacrosse are um, Double Ball. Double Ball is, um, is a, a game that was traditionally played by Six Nations people as well. And uh, different origins of, of, of the game. Uh, of double ball and it's played with the ball similar to this. Now this is uh, more of a miniature one. We make these um, uh, miniature ones to play because they're, uh, uh, it takes a lot of, of hide from an animal to make one of these. So we made these uh, miniature versions. But um, double ball, uh, the story that I heard and my uncle actually told me this story um, was we made double ball to play in place of lacrosse. Because even a long time ago, not everybody had a lacrosse stick. It wasn't like you went to a First Nations community and a lacrosse stick. Here, here's a lacrosse stick, right? It wasn't like that. Your, your family had to know someone that made them or you make them yourself, but not everybody had them because again, it, it took um, resources. You had to have uh, the animal hide for the netting, um, finding the hickory tree and things like that. So double ball was a game that was played in kind of in lieu of lacrosse. If everybody didn't have a lacrosse stick, we played this game. And double ball again is just um, two balls connected with a, a piece of leather in the middle and you use a stick to play it and you just fling it like lacrosse over your shoulder. Now the beauty again about this game is double balls could be made from anything. If you had some extra hide around, 
you could put something in and make a double ball. The stick itself could have been anything. It could be uh, a stick from a tree. You didn't have to, there was no process in harvesting this. This was a ready-made thing that even today kids can go and do. Now, um, I've seen some kids make a double ball today using socks and putting tennis balls or something in there and tying the socks together in the middle. There you have a double ball and grabbing a stick from the forest, on the floor, on the ground, anything. And you have a game. And that's what's beautiful about all of these games is um, they're made from natural resources. You do not need to go to any sports store to buy this stuff. You can make it at home and it doesn't have to look pretty. Um, these are, are pretty well done, but um, you don't have to have that precision. Even making traditional a traditional ball, right? It didn't have to be a perfect size. It could be whatever you wanted. And so there was um, less focus on what things looked like. It was just more get a stick and let's play the game. Double ball was a great offshoot of that as well. And um, so that that is a beautiful game as well. And I had, all right, my kid stole it. Right. Even the lacrosse nets themselves, right? Like um, yeah. for lacrosse, typically that's like, what is a four by four you could have, or like six by 10 or even larger, like field lacrosse nets and stuff. But before, um, you had access to equipment, etc. What what could you use for a lacrosse net? Yeah, traditionally, again, rules and how you score points or get a goal, um, they could vary, right? Uh, I've seen um, old time pictures of, uh, of traditional people playing lacrosse and having uprights. So two trees, they had to put it between. And those trees could be very, very tall. So you could throw it as high as you want. As long as it went through the uprights, you could get a point. And other methods are hitting a post um, instead of uh, having a, a goal or a net made. Um, so traditionally, we never had the four by four nets, right? It was just whatever you could make um, make do with. And so hitting a post or a tree, picking a tree and saying, you got to hit that post. So you could um, even protect that tree playing defense or, or trying to be a goalie and to stop the other person from hitting that tree. So again, just using your imagination um, uh, that's a beautiful thing and creating something from nothing essentially and so um, trying to um, uh, really uh, if you're today today you have nets right we could go out and buy a net somewhere but a long time ago a long time ago again you just made do with what you had you made do with what you had it wasn't didn't mean that you were without you just created a new way to do it and um, one of the, the, the little games that I like to share, and it's not lacrosse or it's not double ball, but it's called Bone and Toggle. And I know Meeks and Kira are both probably familiar with this game, and it's this game here. And again, this is, again, is a, another example of a game that you can create at home. Again, now this one's pretty well done, but this is a stick and this is a piece of bone. And again, a hide from an animal. And what you do with this game, you just rock it back and forth and you try to land it on the stick like that. Such a simple game. But again, kids today could even make this. You could get a, a stick from outside, a piece of string, whatever you had in the house, or maybe a key ring at the bottom, anything um, to be able to allow you to play a game like Bone and Toggle. So again, um, similar to lacrosse, but on a much lower scale when it comes to equipment is the game of Bone and Toggle. <coughs> Excuse me. But a beautiful game um, with really great um, spiritual connection. Again, you have the wood coming from the tree, the hide from the animal, and a bone. Um, and again, back to using natural resources as hunters and gatherers. Um, uh, hunting animals was one of our main sustenance sources of, of, of life, right? Um, hunting deer for our people was, was a big thing. And... But again, those are living things. So when we hunt, like I mentioned earlier, we give thanks for that. And another way to give thanks and honor this animal that you have taken is using everything in that animal um, to recognize it, to give it value instead of just taking it and for, for food. We used everything we could. So we used the hide for games, clothing, shoes, whatever you wanted. But we also used the bones. So the bones of the animal were even used. Um, and uh, we did have different tools a long time ago to, to help shape things. Um, you could use bones as carving tools as well. So 
in honor and respect for the animal that you've taken um, for food, you also use every bit of it that you can, the hide and the bones, and there's other uses as well for different parts of the animal. So again, a, a very um, well done piece of equipment here again, but something that could be um, duplicated by anyone anywhere. And um, you have a lot of fun with this game. And I think it's um, important to note that lacrosse and, and these traditional games to me are, are more than just games. Yes, we have fun. Um, yes, it's competition. Um, but there are definitely spiritual, more spiritual connections to it, right? Uh, again, lacrosse is the easy one because it connects right back to our creation story. You're playing essentially for the creator. It was said to be a game for his enjoyment as well. So you have that, that connection. But um, furthermore, you're, you're, um, uh, you're, you're focusing on your body, you're, you're training your mind, you're um, physically and mentally engaged in all of these games. And again, another good example of good medicine. Um, it's more than just uh, passing and shooting a ball. There are techniques to do it, right? There are different things that you need to work through. There's strategy involved in lacrosse. Um, you're part of a team. It's not a really an individual sport, it's a team sport. So uh, strategy involved is how can my teammates help me to achieve our goal of scoring a goal or stopping a goal. Um, so this all translates into everyday life, especially traditionally, right? Um, I, I really believe that um, the games were used almost as training for everyday life, right? You need to learn how to work with your team. If you're hungry and you go out and you're chasing a deer around, you're mo much more successful if you're working as a team as opposed to an individual. Uh, bone and toggle, the hand-eye coordination, you need to be successful at that game can translate into hunting as well. You have to have good coordination, good hand-eye coordination. Um, double ball, again, a team game. Um, just all require different aspects to be successful in everyday life. So there's a real connection with sport, games, and um, you know, life a long time ago, because we are hunters and gatherers. We had to be very physically fit. All of these games have some sort of aspect that um, connects to phys physical wellness. Um, Spiritually, Always, right? Yeah, everything's Always. interconnected. Work the best. <laughs> yeah, yes. interconnected. I, I didn't want to interrupt your flow too much of, of what you were getting into, but uh, with Bone and Toggle, I've seen different evolutions of that hand game as well, right? And I just want to jump back to, you know, stick balls and like backyard lacrosse and what you were speaking out with, with, with the nets. When we yeah. don't have goalies or goalie equipment, that's what we did. We hit off the cross post. We hit off the sidebar, right? And Absolutely. it was the, yeah, that creative, imaginative flow that you were talking about. But even more so, um, again, with talking about these old ways, I, I kind of wanted to tap into how, um, you know, these traditional games, Angohongwe games even have influenced a lot of our modernized sport, right? So if you look at lacrosse and how it's evolved from the different sticks that you've shown us and how it's come to like modern day uh, stick style, you know, with like a triangulated bladed head and, and stuff and like the, what what they call Tupperware sticks in a sense, like the plastic and the metal, right? Um, sometimes when we've worked together, we've also uh, mentioned how other stickball games have been popularized. So if you look at baseball, right, you mm -hmm. have a style of Ongo Homeway games um, that's rel relative and people would say, oh, we're playing baseball or even mm -hmm. hockey and how that originated uh, on the ice or even on, on land, right? So even the translation of hockey, I believed, um, what does agi mean in your in your language? Was it Mohawk that that, that came out of or? Uh, I, I believe so. Um, and my my understanding is like, it, I, I, it's different. Again, like when you talk about, our, our cultures were all oral cultures, right? And so we didn't write anything down, good or bad. Right, um, you can look back at that thinking that's not a great thing because now you forget everything. But in essence, it was the beauty of it because it could live um, through translation, right? And, and um, again, hockey, um, uh, different stories on, on the origins of that as well. Um, Agi, uh, we, my grandfather used to to say that when we hurt each other, as say, for saying like an ouch. Um, but my, my understanding is that it came from slashing each other, playing hockey, playing with this, with this stick and puck on, on, a fl on the ice. 
And um, the story that, that my family had told her that that's where hockey had come from. Um, you would club someone <laughs> and, and they would hurt and they would say, Agi. But um, definitely uh, a lot sometimes of- Sometimes intentional, sometimes not so. It's an accident a lot of times too, right? <laughs> a, a, absolutely. You know, lacrosse is, is, has, got, has the reputation of being a very physical sport. And, and yes, it, it is a physical sport, but when played properly, there is so much strategy, there is so much um, that goes into the game, a lot that stands above the, the physical side of it. Um, physical definitely is a component of it as well. But I don't know if I really answered your question on, on that the hockey part. Um, I think you should tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, I just thought that was something that always stuck, stuck strong with me is um, hockey and how it came from that word agi like ouch yeah. right so if you're playing a stickball game on the ground or even in lacrosse sometimes i've well, when i've played i've got hit in the leg by accident and you know it's that scooping motion trying to pick up the ball because uh, lacrosse is typically played in the air right um it can be played on the ground too but it's a lot faster in the air in between um running on your feet in between the sticks and hockey is down on the ground so there's a lot more chance of injury and in, in getting hit that way right um so that's just why I wanted to mention it, and just the influence that tradition, our traditional ways have had on you know modern sport, and even outside of sport, even just like with ovens or everything else, and uh, how we consider building our homes. So much has been influenced from our original knowledge and teachings here. So, absolutely, you know, um, our traditional ways of life, and I, I've worked with several health organizations over the years, um, and. Um, why it's successful connecting only home games with health is because um, it's our cultural belief that to be um, well everything is interconnected it's not in silos you don't have physical health over here and men mental health over here everything is interconnected and that's what these games help do they connect all of the physical mental spiritual all of that stuff is is connected and games bring that all together as one and um, I think you're seeing that a lot more. And I remember when I played professional lacrosse, um, one of the things that I, I used to do on my own and I didn't really put it together was visualization. And I'm sure both of you guys have done this in your respective sports as well. But when I was playing um, in, in the professional lacrosse, we, had, we would do sessions on visualization where we had a, essentially a therapist come in and help us visualize different scenarios throughout the game so that when we were presented with this game um, it was already in our head we had already visualized oh this is what i'm going to do and it was a natural reaction at that point just to help you prepare for the game as well um, so again um, first nations health is really all inclusive it's not one thing or the other to be a really healthy rounded individual we want to make sure all of our, our things are in good working order and uh, we talked about um, living in long houses a long time ago. We had all of that because we lived, we we're, we're close, tight-knit communities, right? And we all had aunties and uncles and grandparents surrounded us. And that, th those were our outlets, right? If we were feeling down, we could go talk to this person. If we wanted um, some uh, good advice on what, whatever it was, we could talk to this person. If we wanted, um, uh, you know, hunting, advice we could go talk to this person so traditionally we had all of this we had all of our therapists enclosed in one area with us in our in our home setting and um so we don't see that much more now right uh western culture has us living individually in our own house um you know and we don't even sometimes know our neighbors so it's western culture is a lot different than first nations culture in that sense and as First Nations athletes like Kira and I, um, Kira was also on the junior national team and the national development team for canoe kayaking and sprint kayaking and stuff like that. So there's that traditional games influence as well. And then with lacrosse um, and how it's it's like wildfire, it's catching over all over the world. And I think more universities and colleges are um, adopting the game in, into their programs or their sport programming. So I don't believe Ryerson has a team at the moment, but Maybe that this is planting the seed for that <laughs> with the education week and everything going on. But yeah. I wanted to, um, just because we were talking you and your professional sports and just our background and what we share and how we try to grow the game between our different programs was show the different styles of sticks Absolutely. and then maybe even talk about 
you know, why, like for me, I just admire and um, am so thankful that I've been able to pick up the game of lacrosse because there's so, mu so much hope, like there's a holistic approach to being an athlete that I felt like I was missing from all the other sports that I was playing and, and through my coaching that I had received as well as camaraderie uh, between other teams uh, as well as my own teammates, I probably learned more from them than than some of my own coaches, right? Because again, it's just sharing that knowledge and and what's what's embedded in our cultures and uh, just of of being of good mind and good nature. Uh, right, right. So again, with the lacrosse ball, as you can see, with a pocket like this, this kind of stick would be used um, either in box across, which both men and women have, or men's field across, right? So the length of the stick is probably if I extend from my armpit <laughs> all the way up to the end of my finger. That's about a comfortable length for me and most other players. I believe with men's field across, it would be like double the stick length for right. their uh, defensive, like their defensive players, but all the rest of them would have the short stick like this. And then when it comes to women's, women's field lacrosse, which is a lot different than men's field because you know the equipment that you're using um, there's a lot more body contact uh, and stick contact actually in, in men's lacrosse as well as box lacrosse. But in women's, um, there's a lot less and more more rules to ensure safety because we're not wearing that equipment. So yes, in some cases we have like the protective kind of like fenced goggles, a mouth guard. Um, some people might choose to wear gloves or something because like, so the skin doesn't get scuffed if the you know the head kind of crosses over the knuckles. But the stick itself, it's a lot more difficult. Uh, sorry, it's a lot more easier to dislodge the ball than it would be in the deeper pocket of the other sticks, right? But the women's game, I think, takes a lot more finesse and kind of like um, creativity and how you cradle and everything. And because it's so easy to dislodge that ball, like you, you've got to be agile as well and be able to defend that ball and turn and, and swift and sway uh, away from your someone who's defending you, right? While you're trying to uh, bury the goal, bury the ball in the back of the net. Um, I've heard. Um, I think I wanted to ask. So, um, what about varsity level sports? How do you think this would be impactful um, for universities and college to start picking up lacrosse? Like, is it is it more than just like another sport adding to a roster? Do you think there's there's something more to it, and why it's important? Yeah, I, I think there's something more to it. Um, and uh, to touch on what you were saying there, I, I've heard. Um, women's field across described as um more more um more alike our traditional game than the modern version you see today um you know it was um said that a long time ago we didn't have the, the deep pockets um as much as you see today now <clears throat> now with the women's field across stick yeah, there, there's a, that would be a, um, a men's box across and there's even a women's box across now as well that would be a stick used in, in more in box and field I know the women have um, little to no pocket in their net and what's the rule on that Mequon how deep can your pocket be so as long as you can see the ball over the sidewall this is the plastic edge right so you can see it over top yes. whereas if it was back in this stick which I'm just starting to realize might almost be illegal because you don't want the pocket the whole ball should not be beneath the sidewall, as you can see right there when I push it down. Um, but it actually should just about float a little higher, lower, depending on the, the comfort of the person holding the stick, their relationship to it, and how they like their pocket. Um, that, right? Yeah, so with the, the pocket sticks, you can hold the stick down, um, down like this. With a women's field across stick, it's more upright, I believe, um, as would be the more comfortable position to hold it so it gets caught in the lower the lower part of the, of the plastic there so two different huge two huge differences in sticks and i think maybe we should um i want to step back and um talk about the different forms of lacrosse because lacrosse is, is has does have a couple different formats and you're seeing that evolve like you had said Miquan, uh, lacrosse is really becoming mainstream now i grew up playing traditional box lacrosse now traditionally these games were played in fields, right? We didn't really have a, a set um, uh, area. It could be anything. It could be over to that, you know, um, river over there and, and another kilometer over that way <laughs> and back to the, this tree back here. That was the boundaries, right? You could set those. Again, rules are made on the spot. Now the game has changed <clears throat> with a formation of leagues and competition 
box across obviously played in a, an arena and um, uh, similar to a hockey, really similar to hockey, five players and a goalie on each team. And, uh, and then you have field across, which is really popular in varsity and schools and different leagues that's played in more of a, a soccer pitch, like uh, of, of a zone. So <clears throat> two very different games with very different rules. Again, box across is more, um, I think more of the physical um, side, more so, a little bit more so than field because we have protect protective equipment all up and down our arms, which allows you to cross check on the arms, something that you cannot do in field across. Uh, field across, um, minimal equipment worn, especially for the girls. Um, only have protective uh, eye eye coverings on and maybe some gloves. Um, again, so you have box lacrosse and field lacrosse, um, both lacrosse, but both uh, with their own unique rule rule sets. Now, um, lacrosse uh, again is really growing. I, I believe, and I'm pretty sure it's still the stat that lacrosse is the fastest growing field lacrosse is the fastest growing um, scholarship sport in the U.S. for women, and um, so you're seeing this being played at a, uh, at a school level more and more. Um, more and more people are using school as a vehicle to um, get through school, right? So you're getting scholarships are being awarded um, a lot more. Um, you're seeing different programs arise in all school levels, right? From um, more so in high school up to university and college levels as well. And uh, again, it's just, um, lacrosse is just a beautiful game that everybody could benefit from, especially if you connect it to the culture, especially if you connect it to the culture and make that connection. Um, it's a game that you can play with um, purpose and meaning. And I, I feel like everybody, no matter what sport you're playing, should know the history of that sport as well. Um, I think it gives you a better connection to that game. But um, again, lacrosse is an outlet, I think is a beautiful thing and it can be used many different ways um, in that sense. Um, and schools, having school teams, again, just a, another team sport that um, has so many benefits for people. Uh, I think, you know, more and more we realize um, how sports can have a positive impact on everyday life, right? Anything else, Miquan? I had, a, I had a couple of questions just like, Around the pathway, I know um, I, you touched a little bit about getting into schools, also going pro. Um, for me, within my sport, kind of the dream was always, you know, compete at the Olympics or compete at Worlds, uh, compete at Pan Ams. Right. Uh, look forward to uh, Canada Games as a young kid as well, or just World Nationals. Um, I know uh, lacrosse is growing so much, but what are some new competitions that, or that pathway to those competitions that are kind of, uh, have now arised? Right, um, there, uh, I think definitely the lacrosse seems to be a, what they call a blue collar game, a blue collar game. And I can only speak to that because of my professional experience where I played on teams that were uh, big city centers like Albany in New Jersey and, and the, in the US, but it didn't really take. Um, even though they have really solid school-based programming there, it didn't take. So what you're seeing more now is different um, towns, different leagues being developed at a, uh, for kids at a young age. I think that's where the, the huge difference is going to be going forward with lacrosse is impacting youth, um, impacting um, young kids, whether it's in schools or through summer programs, um, having lacrosse leagues available for youth to experience lacrosse camps. I know um, Meeks had mentioned um, um, doing different lacrosse camps uh, and those are, are, are key, introducing them to the game at a young age. So you're seeing a lot more than that. Um, again, um, Ongahoe Games has been going into schools for the last couple of years at least, um, introducing people to lacrosse. And um, kind of uh, uh, you're, you're seeing that growth and you're seeing that introduction and you're seeing lacrosse become played more and more. And I, I never really could quite make that connection why lacrosse wasn't bigger than it is because it is for my people, uh, Six Nations, connected to our story of creation. So this game has been around forever, probably much longer than many other mainstream sports out there, but yet it's, um, it's taking a long time to grow. But I, I am happy to see that it is growing 
um, a lot more people are playing it. A lot more people are getting interested in, in it. And um, I think you'll continue to see that as long as we can keep getting out there and promoting that game to youth. And, um, and having different outlets for people to, to view the game in its various formats is key as well. So uh, that growth of the game um, will continue as long as there's people like uh, myself and, and you guys out there. And, and that goes for any sport, right? It goes for any sport. We all play sports for, for different reasons, whether it's um, an escape, whether it's for competition or otherwise, but having that exposure to what's possible out there. Because uh, I remember playing lacrosse because I love the game. And it wasn't until I got to my junior levels that I realized that, hey, you can play this professionally. Right? Or, you know, you can get paid to play this game. I didn't even think about that stuff. So, having um, people to share their experiences and uh, will really grow the game. Well, as you've already shared, lacrosse is a thriving sport around the world. And for the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Iroquois Confederacy, you know, lacrosse still inspires um, a lot of cultural passion and uh, community community healing and well-being so you know this game remains a source of pride for those who play like yourself and I uh, Dallas and for those others others today who continue not just today but tomorrow and thereafter I think it's going to have a powerful influence in in many realms of how we're moving forward in this world and I uh, thank you for sharing everything that you have at this time Kier do you have anything else you wanted to share I just I wanted to uh, I know I know you guys give back uh, to the game a lot and, and do different things. I'd, maybe Dallas, if, if you wanted to touch on um, some ways that you give back and how you get into the schools and, and maybe how to contact you. Right, so um, again, um, my, my business is only Hawaii Games. I have a, a huge background in lacrosse, but that's not all that I do. So I, I like to connect the history and the culture to the game as well. And I think that's um, a key thing for moving the game forward as well. And um, uh, having the origins of the game to me um, is just as important as playing the game itself. So at Only Hawaii Games, um, there are many games that I can help um, people learn about the origins of it and making that connection to it. And um, I think uh, one of the things that um, I, I'd like to talk about as well before we hit the road, uh, I think I've seen it on your, the set of questions that they provided with us there, was the political impacts of lacrosse and um, <clears throat> I think um, there's definitely a political side to to sport in general um, you're seeing that more and more now with um, the Black Lives Matter um, NBA and hockey refusing to play um, you know Colin Kaepernick taking a knee those are all political stands using their 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 respective sports for vehicles right and um, lacrosse has um, um, a, 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 in itself a political history um, when lacrosse was kind of adapted and to a more of a mainstream um, or taken outside of the community I believe the gentleman's name was George Beers the, the history books say he seen um, native people playing this game and thought it was a fabulous game and he took this game and introduced it to um, other people and created leagues and as these leagues developed um, native people were actually excluded from playing in the games. Um, so we have uh, the origins of the game, the originators of the game being excluded from competition. And so right from that onset, it became a political a game at that point. Um, there's stories of non-native teams bringing in um, fair-skinned native players to play as ringers on their team. Um, so, and that's, so that's just an old example from a long time ago. Now today, you have uh, our Six Nations team called the Iroquois, um, Iroquois Nationals team who are finding themselves um, in a political arena as well as um, you know, a field across arena um, when it comes to participation in um, world tournaments that take place in other parts of the world. And um, of not being, of not, being uh, not recognizing their passports as a sovereign nation. So again, you have this political connection. So the Iroquois nationals have fought, have been fighting for years, almost at the inception of their of the um, the team, to be included in tournaments 
that are played in other parts of the world, having their status recognized as sovereign nations and not um, Canadian um, is an issue. And that is still huge today. Um, I'm sure if you Googled Iroquois Nationals, you could find many of articles that um, are very political in nature. So there's definitely a political side to lacrosse that's um, still there today. And um, I, I think the big connection or, or disconnect is that other, um, other nations haven't recognized the Haudenosaunee as their own nation, as their own people. We've always been under that um, umbrella of Canadian natives. But you ask any uh, proud Haudenosaunee man or, and woman, um, we are our own people. We were never Canadians at the beginning. So we have our own governance structure. We have our own games that we play. And um, our games are connected right back to the story of creation. So until that recognition happens of being sovereign people, um, the politics and lacrosse will probably never go away for teams like Iroquois Nationals. And a big assist and shout out to Ireland Lacrosse for withdrawing uh, from the World Games so that they could uh, support the entry in respect of Iroquois Nationals. And I, th I think um, a good way to finish off maybe is just uh, sharing that flag behind you and what that means and how it extends to other nations and how people can uh, take shelter under the great law of peace. Absolutely. I mentioned um, with um, my program, Oh Homey Games, um, when I go out, uh, again, the history is just as important as playing the games, yeah, maybe even more so for me. And this flag you see behind me is called the Hiawatha Belt. It was originally a wampum belt. Now, wampum belts were something we created to keep track of our history a long time ago. We didn't write things down. No, we created um, images, I guess you could say, um, to help us keep track of that. Now, this one, has five symbols on it, as you can see. And in the middle, it kind of looks like a tree and um, a very, very significant symbol in, in Haudenosaunee culture, again, called the Hiawatha Belt. Each symbol on that flag represents a First Nation, um, our nation within um, the original five nations. So before we were six, we started with five. Now this flag behind me is also like a map of our traditional territory because right now the community of Six Nations located along the banks of the Grand River, this was not our, our old traditional territory. We originated from the U.S. Um, our traditional territory stemmed from Niagara Falls all the way east to Albany, New York. So each symbol on that flag behind me represents a nation within that traditional territory. <coughs> and um, it was, again, very, very important stuff that I like to teach uh, who the Six Nations are. And um, just to run through that, we'll say, we'll call that east over there and this side west. Um, the Mohawks were the furthest east. Beside the Mohawks, we have the Oneida. In the middle where the tree symbol is, is the Onondaga. Beside the Onondaga, we have the Cayuga. And then right in Niagara Falls, we have the Seneca Nation. And if you notice at the ends of, of the flag, um, the little white bar extends out. Uh, this was um, a really significant uh, meaning because it, it opened up um, this confederacy system to anybody that else that wanted to come and join. And a long, long time ago, 1722 to be exact, the Tuscarora Nation came to make it the Six Nations. So again, a symbol, but with a lot of meaning and uh, a lot of teachings. And that's just a quick run through of, of what that is. But um, some of the things that I think are very important when you're connecting sports to the Six Nations is who are we? Where did we come from? So I, th I think it's really awesome that, you know, programs like Onga Hallway Games, Iroquois Lacrosse Program, yeah. others uh, that are in existence, even professional players, you know, initiating their, their own instructional pieces and being invited into uh, district school boards or First Nations communities or, or other urban and, and rural community programming to get that first piece of introduction and taste and to pick up the stick and actually surprise yourself at how quickly you can learn. Because I played... So many sports, um, you know, basketball, volleyball. I was a cheerleader and a football player at the same time, wrestling, track and field. And when I came aco across lacrosse, um, it had a strong indigenous influence upon me, you know, being Meshkegok Cree. And I wanted to learn more about another, the other nations that were attached to this with the Haudenosaunee and the, the Iroquois, right? So um, for me, that, that, was, that was a big pull in and tie in what drew, drew me more, right? But I mean, 
there's so many Canadians that, you know, this is known as Canada's national sport, national summertime sport. And it used to be just known as the national sport alone. And just the influence and the love that people have had with picking up a stick or being able to watch their loved ones uh, play and use their gifts, right? And and how that's catching on like wildfire, wildfire. So I think an indigenous um, sport pathway, I guess the North American Indigenous Games, which is basically like the Olympics for youth ages 13 to 19, uh, used to be extended like to all ages, but they had to condense it just because it was it was a lot to manage. And a lot of those coaches were also still athletes, you know, competing in the games. So it got more focused for the youth at first. And then for, for adults, there's also the Masters Indigenous Games and, and so many other leagues that are existing um, here in Ontario, the Lacrosse Association. Um, but also, I think on a national level, everyone's, they're, they're popping up everywhere. The league, more and more leagues are growing. But I think a really cool thing to be a part of would be some friendship or invitational tournaments that are, that are open, right? And you get to compete. You know, you might be along, you might find yourself alongside someone who might be a professional or on their way, like in a few years, will will be at that level. And I think um, you could probably speak to that, Dallas, how that experience for, for some individuals is like, they, it's something they always get to talk about, or even, you know, holding a wooden lacrosse stick for the first time, or maybe just seeing um, how it's growing internationally. I mean, there's, there's so much in the world of lacrosse, and I'm so thankful to be a part of it. And um, yeah. we can have this, scratch of the surface kind of conversation today about it all yeah, uh, yeah. definitely when when I, I work with kids that are, have never played the sport or are introducing it to people that are not really familiar the look on their face when they have that stick in their hand is what it's all about for me um, whether anyone goes on to become a professional player that's uh, kind of secondary but mm -hmm. the feeling you get uh, the freedom I think it's a lot about freedom when you're playing this game, having the stick, having to control that ball uh, in that stick, right? Um, it, it speaks to uh, um, a very uh, primitive um, bones in our body that you're free. I think it was just, you know, um, learning the history and, and connected with the game in another level, right? So um, when you really pick up that stick and you start playing that game to be connected spiritually, um, it just, you know, brings so much more to the game and, and connects you so much more to, to, like you said, the good medicine and, and what sport is and how it's um, connected to Indigenous health and, and, and health of, you know, mental aspects. And so um, I think just thank you again for, for uh, teaching us about the game of lacrosse and, and really connecting us in that way when, when we pick up uh, a lacrosse stick or actually any game um, that's connected back to uh, kind of indigenous technology, that way of, of developing a, a sport. Right, right. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys is, and um, for people that don't know who you guys are, you guys are both huge athletes, great athletes. And tell me how you guys feel when you're playing a game or doing a sport that you love. I want to start with Kier. Tell me how you feel, Kier. Yeah, that was kind of, you know, what I was kind of touching on there is just um, the, the 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 spiritual level of it for me, um, kind of uh, connecting with the water. My, my sport is canoe kayak, um, so the, the first time I was in a boat, I was I was my dad had me out when I was like five months old. So like you, I uh, I grew up in that sport and and got connected very very early. So. Um, just kind of traveling around, but also kind of learning about um, about you know the the different ceremonies of how uh, canoes were made, um, the technology behind it of of bending the cedar, of um, giving thanks to those trees. So really connecting me that way, and 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 bringing sport back um, to me was also a way of of how I could learn about my culture. Uh, so I'm very fortunate for sport in that way, and and kind of um, opening up those avenues to to learn about culture through sport because sport is something that I really enjoy and and like me I'm a, a very you know um, I, I competed at a high level in canoe kayak but I also played a lot of other sports so just connecting me back to my culture and learning about culture um, through sport was was very powerful to me so um, I think like you said, it, it's also very, uh, you know, medicine to me, uh, getting on the water. Um, there's a, a, a 
kind of a technique that I would use and I called it trio. Um, so uh, before I would get on the water and try and, you know, change my mentality or um, be able to focus on what I wanted to do to get out on the water, I would touch, you know, something uh, and significance of a tree, but tree and then all those problems would go into that tree and then I'd be able to get on the water with a with a good mind and focus on that. Um, that was that was kind of something. So, so when I got on the water, it was, it was very, like you said, free and just able to focus and enjoy it. And uh, and overall, just uh, kind of open up my mind and and exercise my body as well. Absolutely, that's beautiful. Me, me, Quan. Same as Kier. No, I just <laughs> um, in in similar lights. Like uh, when you talk to the spiritual nature of the game, like. Um, and it's a gift, you know, we, we use that energy and show our gifts. And, and of course, I think as an individual, we all feel our different strengths and weaknesses. And I think, you know, people like to capitalize and, and, and promote us and, and, and talk about how we're doing good, but, you know, we need to work on those other areas for our own confidence and competence. And, uh, when you talk about the spiritual people that included me in the game early, um, like I said, I learned more from one of my teammates who is now passed on. So that's a, a strong significance today where I, I still play for her within within my mind. And as a, as a team, it's had a strong influence upon us as, as well with the Grand River attack. Um, and then the woman, uh, a woman named Rose first got me involved with the game and the dedication that she wanted uh, to see towards like including women in sport you know, just young girls, she would travel 40 minutes one way, 40 minutes back for me to come into the arena and learn and then do another 80 minutes uh, there and back to drop me off and take herself home. And that was multiple times. And um, I'm so thankful for that. And I think with, with those in mind, I've, I've carried, you know, I've carried that forward and also used, like when you talk about when I play, when I play or when I'm, when I'm competing in, in these sports, there's, there's a lot of emotions involved because there's, there's yes, there's on the floor, there's this world and, and being able to sh sometimes shut off, but sometimes the outside world and what's what's happening in your life, you can't help but, but separate it from your mind, right? So you might get more aggressive on the floor, or you might be more emotional if, if you happen to get hit or you happen to miss a shot and you, you play that mental game, right? So when you talk about the interconnectedness of the, the, mental, the mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, it's all wrapped in. And what I really appreciate is that, um, that energy is so contagious, right? And it's so easy to feel that good energy when you get to celebrate, but there's the other part of when you're playing in a game style, somebody has to lose, right? And the emotions that surface with that and being able to humbly and, um, you know, being able to to lose to lose with honor as well, um, res 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 respectively. But I think in another sense, it's being able to be transformational with that energy and use it for better. So when you talked about having that outlet, you know, this is this is a form where I'm able to go out and release release those emotions in, in a good way with certain rules, um, but also just to to know that everything else that's happening in my life, like use those emotions for better and, and transform it into something that's more powerful beyond what it what what that emotion originally sat with, how it sat with with you, and how it can change and the experience that it could have otherwise. Right. So um, that's a little bit long winded, but I mean. You asked. <laughs> that's, that's what I want to hear, right? Is, is that deeper connection to um, to sport and, um, and and self? Deeper connection to self. Uh, most awesome stories. I, I love that. Thank you guys. And I'm, and I'm glad it. I held it. I'm glad I held it together because um, because <laughs> uh, my actually today my dad would have passed two years ago and he oh. didn't get to watch me play lacrosse too much, so that's on my mind today. So I'll release that in a good way, but. <laughs> I'm glad um, we created a safe little environment for us to share that with one another and um, it truly is a powerful game and um, I'm so happy I'm a part of it so we go well, for sharing awesome. for everything he's definitely watched you play <laughs> yeah thanks guys you everybody mm -hmm.